Hi, this is Mark Weitzman, and uh, welcome back to my uh, YouTube channel, Theoretical Physics with Mark Weitzman. Today I want to start a sequence of videos that I promised a few years ago on um, small oscillations. I wasn't happy with the way they did it on the um, MIT uh, course, uh, Vibrations and Waves 8.03x, and um, this is treated in a lot of uh, different ways. Um, today I'm just going to show you the um, the classical um, brute force way of doing things. So um, today we're going to do a um, we're going to do a group theory. Group theory and physics, but we won't actually do any group theory today. But we're going to start a sequence on small, full, small vibrations and oscillations. And um, just for some references, This is, of course, treated in, you know, the standard classical mechanics textbooks, Goldstein and uh, Landau, and uh, Lipschitz, uh, Volume 1, Classical Mechanics. Um, it's also treated, and this is the treatment that I'm going to follow today in a lot of mathematical te physics textbooks. I'm going to follow a treatment by Matthews and Walker. They do a group theoretical treatment, but they also show you how to do it without any group theory. And so today I'm just going to do it, not the whole theory. I'll start the general theory next time. Um, by the way, the group theory aspects of this the group theory approach is treated in most um, in most group theory textbook. I'm going to follow Shannonstead, who has a very good treatment in Chapter Two, Part Two, Chapter Two. Um, Georgie has a nice short treatment in. Um, Sections 1.16-1.17. Um, and um, Z treats it also in Part 3, Chapter 2. But be careful, because he makes a lot of mistakes. And I was once talking to him, and he said, Boy, I wish I could do a, a second edition of this group theory book and redo that chapter. So, um, today I'm just going to follow Matthews and Walker. And their initial treatment, just on the eigenvalue treatment, is on 155, 157. And then the group theory treatment is on 445-448. dash so the idea today is I'm just going to use no group theory, no symmetry arguments. Just a simple, and the problem is going to be very simple. It's a vibrating triangle in a plane. We have three masses, all of the same mass M. But I'm going to call them by, you know, this one's going to be M1, M2, M3. And there's springs that are, you know, holding them together. And they all have the same spring constant, K. And the coordinates, you know, like for M3, these are the small coordinates. The um, position coordinates on equilibrium are like we can use whatever we want. I just use these zero zero one zero, 
and then one half square root of three over two. And the coordinates, like for M3, the degrees of freedoms, this would be X3, Y3, so if it moves a little bit, X2, Y2 for the second mass, and X1, Y1 for, for, for M1. So they vibrate a little bit. Remember, we're doing small oscillations. You're not going to find two over here and so on. But the symmetries are useful, but we're not going to do that. And I'm going to use a vector chi, which is just going to be, um, uh, the book uses x1, y1, comma, x2, y2, comma, x3, comma, y3. These are the six degrees of freedoms. So chi is, this is a vector, and that's equal to that. In my Maple worksheet, which I showed later, and I don't feel like changing now, I accidentally used this sequence of vectors, but it's no big deal. can easily be changed. Um, so the uh, kinetic energy is going to be equal to 1 half m each mass i i squared. And the potential energy is going to be equal to 1 half k x squared, but it's going to be a quadratic form, sum over i j, chi i, chi j. And, um, oh, with a coefficient here, v i j. So this is the most general kind of potential energy, which is quadratic. Equilibrium, there are no linear terms because we're at equilibrium. We don't need the constant terms. And now you can either think of it as a Lagrangian equal T minus V and use the uh, Euler-Lagrange equations of motion. Or you just think of it as Newton's second law, either way. Second law. And we have, uh, basically, you get m chi i double dot is equal to minus the partial of v with respect to chi i, which is equal to minus k sum over j, v i j chi j. v is symmetric, v i j equal v j i. That gets rid of the one-half factor. So our usual ansatz... I don't think I spelled that right, is just assume that chi is, goes as a e to the minus i omega t. So it's vibrating. And we want to get the frequencies and we want to get the normal modes. So this is like a vibration in a normal mode. And uh, if you substitute this in here, you're going to get the sum over j, vij, chi j equals lambda chi i. That's the eigenvalue equation. I defined lambda as m omega squared over k. Okay. So the normal modes are the uh, eigenvectors. of the uh, matrix Vij. And with uh, eigenvalues, lambda related to frequencies by um, omega equal to the square root of lambda k over m. So Matthews and Walker they give uh, they give this expression for v v one half k x2 minus x1 squared plus 
minus one half x three minus x two plus the square root of three over two y three minus y two squared and then they have another term plus one half x one minus x three plus the square root of three over two y one minus y three square again let me use so you can see what's going on there that's bracket square and that's this whole thing so um at one point in time i i, I looked at this like about five or ten years ago and I thought I understood this expression but now I can't seem to get it and uh, without since I want to use a brute force approach and without thinking too hard I simply said well look it's it's the potential energy in a spring is one half kx squared we know at equilibrium it has uh, that's we know the equilibrium length as I drew it is one well yeah each side of the equilateral triangle is has length one so just take the uh you know the dis the new distance minus the old distance that's how much it's been stretched and square that so um i i decided i'm just going to use v equals one half k now i have a more complicated expression but i get the new distance as the square root uh, remember particle two is starts at coordinate one so it's total coordinate is 1 plus x2 minus x1. x1 doesn't have a constant because it's 0. Square plus y2 minus y1 squared minus 1. That's the, This is the length, the extra distance, how much it's been stretched, and then we square it. Plus, now we have the other two particles. 1 half, this is particle 2, Part, actually this is particle, this is 3, I labeled 3 on top, I've got like 3, 1, 2, so we did the 1 and 2, now we're doing the 1 and 3, so 1 half, this is the third is the coordinate, the middle of the, for the 3 particle, minus x1, squared plus square root of 3 over 2 that's the y plus y3 minus y1 squared that's the new length minus the old length that's the stretch squared and finally we'll do the 3 and the 2 we'll have a uh, square root one half plus x2 I don't know why that's x2 minus this is what I have written here I'm not sure this is right particle two is at one I wonder if I did that right Um, hold on one second. Doesn't seem right. Okay, I see. X. X3 is, um, what we're doing is the difference between these two things. X2 has a 1 plus X2 and X3 has a half plus X3. So 1 minus a half is 1 half. So that's right. Plus y2 minus y3 minus the square root of 3 over 2 squared minus 1 squared. So this is the exact expression. And um, as you'll see, if we uh, Taylor expand... It agrees um, with uh, Matthews and Walker.
So the best way to do this thing is not to spend hours doing it by hand. You know, nowadays, use software to um, to uh, find the uh, eigenvalues. It's not too hard to do by hand because there's three zero modes. I'll talk later about that, but we're going to end up with um, three zero eigenvalues. So those like sort of factor out. And then we're going to have two eigenvalues that are the same and one eigenvalue that's different. So the um, the equations are probably solvable and doable by hand, but it just takes too long. So now I just want to show you a worksheet. I've worked this out before and I'm not going to do it on the thing. But so this is software. I won't name them, but you can figure it out who it is. Uh, so this is um, with linear algebra. That's a package, so you can just call the commands without prefacing it. Now my chi vector, like I said, I did it a little backwards. I wrote it as x1, x2, x3, y1, y2, y3, but that won't make a difference. This is the expression that Matthews and Walker uses. And... Um, now this is my expression. I'm going to take a Taylor expression of this thing. When you um, for this particular command in this software, when you put chi there, it just assumes you're expanding around chi equals zero, which is what I want. And I'm only going to take terms which are lower than third order. So when I do it, I get this expression. And um, if I subtract the Matthews and Walker expression from that and simplify, I get zero. So it's the same thing. Now, the next thing that you want to um, do is you want to put that into a matrix. And you can just do it by hand. For instance, this is a symmetric matrix. So the 1, 2 element is going to be minus 1. And the 2, 1 element is going to be minus 1 and so on. You can do it by hand in a couple of minutes. Um, which is what I did originally, and then I decided I'd write a five-line program. I don't recommend programming with this software. It's horrible, but um, every now and then I use it. So this basically says, for the index, first I create a matrix. I call it VIJ. It's a six-by-six six matrix. And then I take for the indices in the matrix and the values in the matrix. I don't use the uh, values, but I think i got to put that there. And then I define the new elements of the matrix. I take the index in Vij, and, and it's one half. Now, this expression is a little weird. Let me just, um, there's probably easier ways to do this. Basically, I want to just convert that quadratic form to a matrix of coefficients. But let's look at this first term. The first term takes the coefficient of the expression V, which I have here, takes the coefficient which has, let's say I'm trying the ij element, so I'm going to take the j variable, which has chi j in the expression. So it's going to look for chi j, let's say j is um, 3, it's going to look for things which have a chi x3 in there, because chi 3 is x3, so it's going to look for that, and it's going to find minus x2 over 2, because this command only works on single variable polynomials at a time but you can do it twice so once I get this term and I think I'm going to get other terms you know I'm going to get this term as well I'm going to get other terms then I do it again I take the coefficient of whatever this was now I do the chi of the indices in the one so um, trust me this works at least so now you're going to get all the terms that are like 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, but you're not going to get the 2, 2 terms because the 2, 2 terms, you have, um, let's see if I can find it. Uh, I'm looking for the x2 squared term. Where is it? Okay, here. So it's 5 fourth x2 squared term. I'm only asking in that command for the x2 term, so it doesn't see a linear term, but there is a squared term. So I have to say if the indices are equal, and I had to half it because half goes to, it's a symmetric matrix, half goes one to one part, half goes to the other. 
So if the indices are equal, I just take the coefficient in V of chi of that index squared. So that would give me n diff, n do. And there is my matrix. And you, like I said, you can do it by hand and get the same thing almost as easily. And then you just use one command, eigenvectors. It will give you the eigenvalues. Here are the three eigenvalues. Like I said, there's three zero modes. I'll explain that in a second. There's one th lambda equal three, lambda equal three halves, lambda equal three halves. So this is a degenerate frequency as well. Now the eigenvectors here actually go down. They're not, not across. They go down. So let's look at the zero modes. For instance, if you were to look at this last eigenvector, what you would see would be that each of them has an x-coordinate that goes 1, 1, 1. So it's just a translation of the triangle by 1 in the x-direction. Now, the problem with some of the software is you can't always see, you know, it's the combinations. If we add the second eigenvector to the first eigenvector, this cancels, this cancels, this is 0, we get 1, 1, 1. So this is the translation in the y-direction. And then there's one more eigenvector. The final eigenvector is a zero mode is what they call a rotation. And it's some combination of these three eigenvectors which just rotates each, um, rotates the triangle. So at constant speed, constant angle speed. So we expect with um, six degrees of freedom, we're all in, in a plane, we're gonna get two translational zero modes and we're going to get one rotational mode, and we get that. Now the other eigenvectors, um, the three, three halves, and three halves, here you have to work them out and think about them, and it's much easier to do in the symmetry, but I'll just show them to you just for a second. So the... Um, so I, I, I said already that we have 0, comma, 0, comma, 0 eigenvalues. And these are best thought of as an X translation, Y translation, and a Z rotation, rotation about Z axis perpendicular to the plane through the uh, center of the triangle. And now uh, we'll work out later when we do symmetries, but the three eigenvalue, that's the easiest one. The three eigenvalue corresponds to what we call a breathing mode. And basically, each one just goes in and out along its direction. Goes in, and then, you know, a little bit later, it's like this way, and, you know, goes inside, inside, inside. And then, you know, on the frequency, you know, eventually we'll go back, you know, equilibrium, and so on. Um... Now there's um, another mode, the three halves eigenvalues, there's two modes, two linearly independent eigenvalues, and one of them is like this, I don't think I drew that right, so this one goes up and down like that, and these two go like that, um, I could go like this see it better but actually that makes it harder to view and then there's another one which um, I have to think about but it's giving it given in Shenenstead's book I'm not even so sure it's correct 100% but it's something like this so um, I have to think about that one but that's another three halves mode. So I just wanted to give you um, a little idea. This is, is not exactly hard and to, nowadays with software you know Matthews and Walker has a problem of a, um, a tetrahedron 
you know, a, a regular tetrahedron and to calculate the vibrations and breathing modes for that. And I worked out that problem, and I may do it in a, a video in a second or two. You know, in a couple of days, maybe I'll do that. It's similar to this. But again, as you get more particles, you know, then you have four particles and 12 degrees of freedom. And see, this thing has six degrees of freedom, so it's going to co correspond to the, uh, the group S3, you know, the permutation group on three elements. The symmetries here are, you know, we'll talk about, but they're obvious. There's a rotation and a counter rotation and then uh, reflections and doing nothing. So that's our six group operations. When we get to the tetrahedron, it turns out to be the alternating group on four objects, which has 12 symmetry operations. So I guess if you get to very complicated molecules, you're either going to have to use software or some very fancy group theory. But there was a time when this group theory was useful for doing these because, like I said, software wasn't that available and doing the calculations was kind of like a pain in the neck. Anyway, on the... Um, Next video in this um, section on vibrations and small oscillations, I'll start talking about the general approach of um, diagonalizing the matrices and how to get the eigenvectors and modes from a classical mechanics point of view. I just skimmed it here, but this is a little bit more sophisticated. And then I will go on to the uh, group theoretical approach. So um, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.